think uh, this is a um, an awesome opportunity. You know, um, I put I put 2020 with a question mark because hopefully nothing like this ever happens again. But perhaps some, some kind of consortium can can continue afterwards since it's a great great opportunity to hit, hear different people talk from different parts of the country and see see names to faces et cetera et cetera um today i'm going to be talking about lasers particularly in my my division which is laryngology i'm faculty here at emory all right let's see um, really the objectives in a nutshell are to, to enlighten you guys how uh, I use lasers and how we use lasers in, in laryngology. Um, you know, if, if there's some time, uh, I, I certainly want to present uh, transoral laser microsurgery and, and the tenets and principles. Um, but even if, even if I don't get there at the end, I, I have a number of cases to, to show. Um, you know what what the armamentarium is and what types of pathology to use the laser for um, some surgical videos as well some disclosures um, I do show pictures of commercially available equipment I do not receive any royalties from any of those companies um, lasers are, are truly powerful instruments and um, they have really great clinical potential and really have uh, Made made laryngology a, uh, a a key player for for most laryngeal disease and and close quarters for management of that disease. Um, certainly, the um, personal application that I, I provide you guys of, of my patient cases may differ uh, based on equipment availability and also your attendings preferences. Um, but overall, you know, I'll make some comments of, uh, and a lot of times you can use. Um, multiple different lasers to do the same um, surgery. Um, in regards to references, um, Wolfgang Steiner, who is a, among one of the, the pioneers and leaders of TLM in, in Europe, um, wrote, the, wrote the lecture on um, wrote the lecture on um, the uh, free otolaryngology atlas online. I think that's a great reference. Um, this book below is um, is also great. And then actually the, the Cummings chapter 60 and 108 are, are really well written. Um, lasers have a pretty high board uh, relevance for testing early laryngeal cancer, not so much, but certainly a high life yield for, for every otolaryngologist. So what's a laser? Um, hopefully I'm not dating myself with, with this GIF, but um, um, it's actually an acronym. So it's, it's light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Um, well, what does that mean? Um, you know, historically, and we'll, we'll, we'll go over what lasers are in a minute, but historically in, in Odo, I provided some history, um, the, the first, guys and, and gals who originally um, uh, test this out were actually otologists and when it comes to laryngology uh, both in Europe and uh, US the, the lasers were pioneered. Uh, Dr. Yako uh, up north in Boston was among, among the first to truly clinically use um, the, the CO2 laser for laryngeal disease. Um, so I, I would honestly say he's among the grandfathers of this. Um, but these are kind of the instruments that you're used to, uh, on, on your right is the, the original CO2 laser that Dr. Yako used just left to is the, the current, uh, um, CO2 laser, which is the Acupulse Duo, which is, um, a free beam laser, just like he had, looks pretty much the same other than a little bit smaller. And also the ability to use the, the laser in fiber form. And then over here is your, your KTP laser, Boston Scientific, which um, most people are familiar with. So in laryngology, these are the two main lasers that uh, I'm going to discuss today. But, but what's, what's the nuts and bolts of a laser? Well, all lasers pretty much are composed of three things. You have an energy source. You have the lasing medium, which can be gas, um, such as the CO2 laser or even 
the helium neon laser, which is your, your laser pointer. Um, it can be solid, such as the KTP lasers, which are actually based off of an ND YAG laser, or it can be liquid, like your pulse dye lasers. Um, and then that system is, is housed and you have uh, a reflect, reflecting mirrors um, one total reflector, one partial reflector to actually maintain um, st uh, the stimulated emission. So essentially what's, what's going on is energy is, is supplied to the lasing medium. And if you remember from physics, uh, atoms become excited and they get excited uh, at set quantums or, or set levels. And those electrons, when they're excited, go up an energy level and then when they relax, they drop back down, but in doing so, uh, they release a photon. Um, and in a laser, those photons, uh, I, I, I hate to use the word chain reaction, but they, but they stimulate other electrons in the lasing medium and essentially have higher energy photons floating around and they get reflected back and forth within the resonating chamber. And then some of it, uh, some of the beam is actually, it is not reflected and it, it uh, leaves the resonating chamber and gets focused by a lens and that that's your laser beam. Um, this is actually a, a photo from Cummings which um, pretty elegantly uh, describes what stimulated emission is and it's the you know the absorption of the uh, atoms and the electrons within them to uh, moving to a higher energy state and then the stimulated emission is you can you can imagine that these photons uh, are released and they just fly into other material, energizing them, and then also uh, ultimately uh, releasing these uh, photons. And um, as you know, uh, photons, if you if you think of the electromagnetic spectrum in physics, um, it's a matter of of light. So lasers are in fact um, light but um when you look at the electromagnetic spectrum you know most most of us live here we we know our visible light spectrum um and different photons or, or different um different light has frequencies um as well as energy so uh, i promise this is really the only equation in the entire lecture today but energy is related um to, to the frequency of the light. So it's ener the energy is Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the frequency. So in your ionizing radiation, you have these small um, frequencies. Um, and then in your you know, far infrared region, uh, you have higher frequencies. And if, you know, if you're dividing by a bigger number, you're gonna get, um, get lower energy. So you got lower energy, that the higher energy um, beams of light. Um, but why is laser light different than regular light? Well, um, a few things, you know, if you look at your incandescent light bulb and it's shining out visible light, it's kind of going all over the place as well as um, it's not really focused in any particular directions. Um, laser light by definition um, is collimated. So it comes out and it's all parallel. So all the, the um, all the beams are, are parallel to each other. Um, it's monochromatic, meaning that it's all the same wavelength, whereas visible light that you see from the light bulb, you know, has, has different wavelengths. And then it's coherent, but it, it's uh, both temporally coherent, um, so in terms of time, and then also spatially coherent in terms of phase. So all of, all of the, the wavelengths line up, so to speak, as you can see, and the coherence uh, image there. Um, let's see here. Um, I believe I took this from the Lynn Review book. These are um, the common lasers that we use in otolaryngology. Um, really the main ones that we'll talk about are frankly the ones you guys use regularly which you're attendings and we'll use in the future and that's the CO2 laser and then the KTP laser. But what, you, what you'll see is that they are different wavelengths. Now, this is often pretty testable on, on in-service and certainly pimping questions from your senior residents as well as attendings. But that wavelength um, 
uh, really correlates to some of the, the properties of the laser, which we'll discuss later in, in detail. And that's the depth of penetration. And that wavelength also relates to the chromophore, which is what the, the um, what in the tissue is, is uh, actually absorbing the laser beam itself. Um, some other facts are just aren't as important for laser function, but more uh, utilization is kind of how you deliver it, whether it's fiber optic, uh, KTP uses a quartz or, or glass co uh, contact fiber. And then the CO2 laser um, is really versatile. Uh, we'll talk about that. You can use a hand piece or a quote unquote waveguide. And it's also a free beam laser. So um, without further ado, um, how do lasers work on tissue? So um, whether uh, this block here is tissue or um, you know, metal that's getting etched or whatever, um, lasers interact uh, all in the same way and it's a bit dependent on a variety of things. But the main interactions are uh, dependent uh, or actually determine what the what happens at the level of the tissue and where that energy is being released. So uh, clinically how lasers work, it's uh, deposition of the photon's energy uh, and converting that into thermal energy at the level of the tissue. So well, what does that, how does that happen and, and what, what kind of goes on um, when you fire a laser at something? Well, Technically, what can happen, this frankly is going to be more often with your instrument than with um, uh, the patient's tissue, is the laser beam can get fired and reflect straight back. Um, or it can, you know, reflect at any vector, and that really depends on tissue property more than the laser itself. Um, but that reflection results in no deposition of any energy and has absolutely no effect on the tissue. Um, then we're going to jump all the way to the bottom, which is absorption. Now, absorption is really the, the meat and potatoes of, of how you want a laser to work. Um, so it's the intended outcome of when uh, you fire a laser at tissue. And that, what absorption is, is that laser uh, beam and its energy is deposited at the site uh, and it doesn't go anywhere else. Um, so all the energy is deposited right upon contact at that region, and that's very chromophore specific. Um, and that is wavelength specific by the laser. Um, the other issue, uh, which is in between, is you see these diffuse reflection or nonspecific absorption, and that is the other term that's uh, often uh, tested or at least asked, and that's scatter. Um, what happens with scatter is that that laser beam hits and it plinks around um, within, within the target, and that energy is deposited over time, and scatter is very wavelength specific. So as you can imagine, a short wavelength laser, if you think of x-rays or ionizing radiation, if they have a tight um, if they have a tight frequency, you know, when they hit something, they're going to bump around into everything. That can include DNA, proteins, etc. cetera. Um, as the laser wavelength increases, so if you go a little bit more nonspecific, like NDYAG, um, those, those things, um, or even KTP, um, which is, has a more specific chromophore, those, those wavelengths within the uh, more of the visual spectrum are actually chromophore dependent. And then longer wavelengths um, are, um, are, are also chromophore dependent, but that chromophore is gonna be, uh, gonna be water, which is particularly in all living tissue. Okay. So in Odo, yeah, so this is an absorption spectrum that you see here. Um, it's of the chromophores oxyhemoglobin, which is in the maroon line in water. Um, I highlighted the, uh, the wavelengths of the, the most utilized lasers, or at least that I use, which is the KTP and the CO2 laser. Uh, and what you can see is that these wavelengths, frankly, happen really close to certain absorption peaks of the chromophores. Now, water has a pretty wide absorption over a variety of, of wavelengths, so, but CO2 falls at a region where 
um, there is good absorption. Um, so what, what kind of is the crux of, of, of this slide is that for, for choosing the right laser, um, you, you really focus on, uh, on, on honing in and uh, taking advantage of, of absorption while reducing scatter. So with oxyhemoglobin um, and the KTP laser, the, uh, the, the laser is pretty good for, for red lesions, um, such as hemangiomas and, and stuff like that, um, or even things like papilloma. Um, when you use the, the CO2 laser, now all tissues have water. So um, some of the benefits, what we'll talk about the CO2 laser is because its absorption is pretty um, consistent and universal amongst most tissues, um, because it's so well absorbed, you're going to have less, um, you're going to have more definable uh, laser tissue interactions, which is a pretty superficial um, penetration. So, um, what do we talk about laser settings and what do they all mean? So, just remember that uh, the purpose of using the laser is to convert that laser's energy into a thermal effect on tissue. Um, and laser settings are paramount uh, to this. It might look like we, we randomly click numbers and turn dials, but um, those are just kind of the tried, tried and true settings for the lasers that we know of. Uh, and there's some math behind it, but really uh, it's, it's mainly based on experience and uh, known laser tissue interactions. All right. Um, so, uh, I promise no more equations, but these are these are more um, more related to 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 values and um, the the main things that you need to know in terms of laser variables is um, is the energy um, uh, and energy more clinically uh, relates to power, which you often see as a setting on the laser. Uh, power is just a um, a factor of energy over over time of deposition, so watts or joules per second. The other important variable is spot size. So spot size can be your fiber diameter, um, and it's um, it can also be for a free beam laser uh, determined by your focal length and the focus of the laser. And, and it, it's um, it relates to the distance from the surface as well. And spot size. Um, and power together, they, uh, they are related to radiance or power density. So that's, that's really, this is, this is the variable that is the, the determining factor of the effect that you're gonna have on the tissue. And it's the amount of power and how much uh, of an area that power is deposited over. Um, the next important thing is exposure time. So continuous versus pulsing. And then um, pulsing can have a pulse width, so the duration of the pulse. And then also a frequency of the pulses, so how many pulses per seconds. Um, so really the, the important variables are, 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 are these here in the middle. Uh, and they're really the only ones that you truly um, are, are changing to some extent by, by adjusting the laser. Um, so this is the front of, a, of the KTP laser. Um, this is turning it on. You do need a key to turn it on just in case you're, oh, you're just starting laryngology and you're like, how the heck do I turn this on before my attending comes in the room? So turn the key on. There's a switch in the back and that's how you, how you turn on the laser. But uh, in terms of adjusting the settings, the, the main ones we adjust, adjust is the power. Um, and then the KTP laser is, you can use it in continuous, but it's also used in pulse mode, so the pulse width. So the, the pulse itself um, is 15 milliseconds long, and, there's a, and then the pulse rate, which is the, um, the number of those pulses per second when you leave your foot on the pedal. Um, and then ultimately, really only for the, for the KTP laser, you'll see the amount of, uh, of energy used by the end of the case. Um, but those, those variables are, are the main ones that, that you set. And, uh, frankly, this is a common setting that we use for awake KTP ablation of, of lesions, whether it's 
early cancer or, or papilloma. Um, typically we'll set it between 26 and 30 watts with a 15 to 30 millisecond pulse width, or I'm sorry, 20 millisecond pulse width and um, usually two to three uh, pulses per second. Um, this is uh, the CO2 laser. So it's uh, the uh, AccuPulse Duo, that's what we use. Um, this one has a few more variables as a, as a, as a laser um, because it has a few more modes. Um, but similarly, again, you see uh, that you can set the power, it has recommendations. And then all this stuff in terms of shape, size, depth, that, that relates to, um, to some modes that you might be used to, which is um, the scanning, uh, the scanning mode. So you see here it says scan. And what scanning is, uh, it's often used with a super pulse setting. Uh, so I'll talk about super pulse first. Uh, with this technology, when you put your foot on the pedal, the uh, laser fires a very high energy um, short uh, pulse. And ultimately the, the deposition of energy at the tissue level averages to be the power that's set. Um, but you're talking about, you know, it's, it's shooting hundreds of, hundreds of high power pulses, but the overall average power is what you see on your setting. Um, but when you do the scanning mode, you're able to set a shape as well as a size. Um, and, and that shape is essentially printed or, or, or painted, whatever, uh, whatever word you want to use at the tissue. Um, and um, in doing so, you can get a very consistent, um, consistent laser tissue interaction that's predictable. Um, depth is a set value uh, where, you know, how, how many passes results in a certain uh, depth on the level of hundreds of microns. But overall, the CO2 laser is a very uh, superficially penetrating laser. Um, you know, in terms of, of the, the CO2 laser, when, when, we, when we use it for, for certain pathologies, the other option you can use is here, the CW, um, which is the continuous mode, um, which is often a, a very small spot size and, and you lower the power again, because if you have higher power over a small spot size, you're going to have much more significant laser tissue interaction. Um, so typically for uh, continuous, you know, you'll vary it from, we'll vary it from one to three, uh, rarely a little bit higher wattage. Whereas on the, um, on the scanning mode, which you see here, it's set to a higher, higher power level of five watts. Sometimes we can even go higher, even tells you, hey man, jack it up. Um, that's the recommended um, wattage, but you know, you don't often go that high. Um, so why pulse? Um, well, you know, the main benefit is uh, to avoid residents injuring the patient. But um, the, uh, the, the fact is, is it's, it's much more thoughtful behind that. Um, you're, you're actually uh, benefiting of a couple things. So at, at the level of the tissue, um, there's the concept of heat sinks. Um, so all tissue has blood flowing through it. So when you deposit the energy, um, kind of by, by blood flow and almost, uh, I'm going to use the wrong word, it's, it's not really convection, but essentially the heat's dissipated by flowing, flowing, uh, flowing blood, almost like if you think of your, it's like a counter current exchanger, that's kind of what I want to use, like your air conditioners or water heaters. Um, you know, you have your applied heat source and some of that energy is, is taken away. Um, and in doing so, it uh, reduces the amount of thermal effects at the surrounding collateral tissue. Um, the, other, the other important aspect of, of pulsing is uh, reduces um, the, by, kind of, by actually capitalizing on the heat sink effect, um, patients often can tolerate this more in the awake setting uh, because you're not having as much thermal effects on the surrounding tissues. Um, this can be seen here. This is uh, also from coming. It's a CO2 laser beam. So what you can see is 
the intended effect is vaporization at the level, but you have a penumbra of more uh, thermal spread. And again, some lasers are much more penetrating like the NDAG, but you're, you know, you're going to kill the tissue that is not vaporized into water and carbon dioxide. And then you're also going to have your, your spreading thermal effects. Now, um, with, with the basis of pulsing, um, what you can see is that with longer pulses and more ener energy um, being deposited at the surface, you're going to have more thermal spread of uh, that energy into surrounding tissues. Now, th now this isn't an example of actually, um, this is material science. It's, it's not even, uh, you know, uh, organic tissue, but what you can see is um, you, you certainly can have a more tremendous effect on the surrounding material with longer pulses, even when your power setting is the same versus a short pulse um, results in, in much, much less thermal spread which again is, is dependent on, on properties of, of both absorption and scatter. Um, so, you know, in terms of important slides um, to really discuss laser tissue interactions, um, the, these next few images are, are the ones that I would, I would really focus on. So the main things to remember just from all the slides before is that laser tissue interactions are dependent on wavelength, um, the power that's set, uh, but even more so uh, power over area, which is your power density. Um, and then if you talk about things like repetition rate or time, it's exposure time. Um, so if you have uh, lower power settings or a, a wider spot size or a, a deep focus laser, you know, um, you're really not going to be depositing a lot of thermal energy at the level of the tissue. Um, so versus if you have a, you know, a, a, a small spot size or a high power laser, um, you're, you're truly able to result in uh, dramatic um, laser tissue interactions at the surface and deeper within the tissue. Um, I do well with other pictures um, that are that are a bit more three dimensional, um, but this this picture is also from from Cummings chapter sixty, uh, and what you can see is if you if you think of pot spot size, um, and and really this chart uh, shows working distance, um, which is going to be essentially the focal length you're you're shooting for, and whether or not the laser is actually set at your focal length. Um, so what you can see is that a laser that's close with a small spot size and, you know, even at the same laser setting, you're going to result in significant power density and, um, you know, all these numbers are kind of relative to each other, but you're going to cause significant, um, significant power density and um, uh, amount of uh, probability of vaporization and damage at the level of the tissue. Whereas if you have a larger spot size, whether it's, again, spot size can be the, the setting you set on a free beam laser or the, the width of your laser fiber, and you have a defocused laser, um, then you're not going to be depositing as much direct energy at that site. Um, if, if, you, if you think of, about it, you know, when you're using your CO2 laser and, you know, seemingly things aren't in focus, um, uh, it, laser doesn't work as well. And, and that's because of, of these uh, properties and also a bit of physics that's just out of the, um, kind of out of the realm and out of the, the need for explanation at this point. Um, another way to, to consider this, um, showing all these variables again together, um, if you increase the power um, and you have small, a small fiber, um, you're going to have a tremendous amount of energy deposited at that region, um, even in a short period of time. Um, but if you have a, you know, a big spot size, low power, you're, and your power density is low, and you're, 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 not, you're going to have the lower thermal effects like coagula uh, coagulation versus vaporization. Um, 
so now I'm going to start talking about some laser specifics and, and show some um, particular uh, advantages and disadvantages, as well as uh, show some cases that I selected of mine for, for why I choose what laser. So the, the obvious in the KTP laser is that it's fiber based. Again, it's carried by quartz fiber. Um, typically, the, um, the sizes are, um, can be 0.4 all the way up to, to 0.6, which is a, 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 um, in terms of um, the, the light itself, it's within the visible spectrum. If you never wore uh, blue, uh, blue blocker lenses or the orange lenses, um, you, you see how bright the laser is. And it's actually, um, the potassium titanophosphate is actually within an, an NDAG laser, and that halves the wavelength um, and, and doubles the frequency. So it, it, it is able to shift that, uh, the laser's um, absorption more so on the chromophore of hemoglobin. Um, its advantages is, uh, you know, being, um, being able to be used via fiber, uh, a lot of the initial literature um, was uh, uh, written by Zytels using it for, for a, a wake ablation of laryngeal lesions after noticing that the, the PDL laser didn't work as well. Um, the, um, the other advantages is you can, you can use it on contact mode, so actually place the laser on the tissue, essentially at using it almost like a um, electric cautery, but again, the thermal spread of a laser is far less than, than using a cautery device. And then you can also ablate on non-contact mode. So the KTP laser is an angiolytic laser. So with its specific chromophore, um, you can use it on, on neovascularization, on non-contact, and ablate away small blood vessels. Um, that can result in less bleeding. Um, some of the disadvantages, I, you know, I say it's a less, less precise beam of light. Um, really that, that is more so uh, related to the fact that it's a fiber-based laser and you're using a handpiece. So, if, you know, if everyone has a, a little bit of a tremor, um, it's not as, not as accurate per se as a micro manipulator on a microscope that's fixed. Um, in terms of um, depth of penetration, it's higher than the CO2. Uh, no laser is really great for bulky disease. I just put that there. And no laser really works well with bleeding. So um, that being said, you know, here's a case example of a patient of mine uh, with, with RRP. Um, the fact is, is CO2 laser is great for this as well. Um, the reason I, I place this case under KTP is that he has um, very anterior based disease. And depending on exposure, sometimes someone that's a tougher exposure, um, you're going to have more difficulty um, actually be, being on FOSS and coaxial with your view to really get all that great laser deposition. Again, um, this isn't really the end of the case, but you can take a little bit more down, obviously. So this guy actually presented me, and I thought he had a web from uh, from prior um, prior surgery, but but when I got there, it was just his disease. Um, you leave a little bit behind to avoid webbing, um, since the growth rate of the disease is is greater than it's more rapid than fibroblast coming in causing scar. But um, he he does really well, um, and um, you know uh, again you can use either laser for this. Um, but really for, for uh, nooks and crannies where you need a few more degrees of, of, of freedom with, with your wrist or, or angulation, uh, the KTP laser uh, is great there. Um, I just don't use the, the waveguide um, CO2 laser, but you could, you could seemingly use that as well. And that would um, solve kind of both, both problems. Um, so, so that being said, you know, uh, certainly the versatility of a CO2 laser is great. Um, the, next, um, the next pathology that I think is really beneficial for, uh, for uh, the KTP laser is 
is again when when you really want to use your your hands and almost use a fluid instrument so this is a lady who's um presented me with dysphonia and had uh, a decent sized superglottic mass uh, actually a couple uh they ended up being cysts um but what you what you can uh kind of see here is um you know she's obviously a lot of laryngeal surgery at times is tactile and when you know you, you actually are for for lack of better terms digging around you sometimes want to feel what you're doing and in, in that regard i think a fiber-based laser is beneficial um the co2 laser with the waveguide you can do the same things um this is after um i actually got into the superior laryngeal artery and it bled like stink but um um, but the, uh, the fact is, is you could do that with a, uh, with, with any laser, uh, with a hand piece, whether it's CO2 or KTP, but, uh, effectively for her, I use the KTP laser. And, and again, the reasons are, um, for, for more tactile feedback and then, uh, real time dissection with a, um, with a, uh, with a hand piece. Um, this case, hopefully this video wasn't working when I tried it, but, um, all right. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we won't, won't click that one again. Um, let's see here. Uh, PowerPoint just decided to shut down on me completely. All right. Uh, I'm not going to send that and, uh, it's so funny cause these are all running off my, uh, off my laptop. So let's see, just jump down. Yeah. I won't, won't click that one again. Um, okay. So that guy is a, um, a guy in his late eighties who, uh, who presented to me with, um, with hoarseness and, uh, he ultimately had a, uh, uh, carcinoma in situ of that, that vocal cord. Um, and, uh, he, he, you know, didn't want radiation. He's not the greatest exposure cause he actually has nice teeth and uh, doesn't extend his neck very well. But, um, you know, I, I presented him with um, not gold standard of therapy at all, but uh, because he had very superficial disease, uh, a wake ablation. So uh, I think the KTP laser is um, definitely among the most supported lasers to do that. This is under um, narrow band imaging. So you can see that site of neovascularization. Again, this is just, I think I probably showed Spencer this. So this is under normal light um, where, here, let me, I'm like nervous to slow things down now. Um, but you can see under, uh, under normal light circumstances, it's uh, uh, very subtle findings of, of hyperkeratosis there um, that really pop out with narrow band imaging. Um, which I, I think is super, super great for, uh, for laryngology. Um, let me see here. Um, now, okay, let me just make sure. Are you guys um, still hearing me? Yes, we can hear you. And All right. You. I just lost my own view and I don't know if anything, I just wanna make sure I'm not talking to myself cause that just gets real awkward. <laughs> um, so, okay, as long as you guys can still hear me cause I just yeah, lost- we, hear you. we just can't see your screen. Oh, all right. Um, hmm. 
Can you see me now? Yes, we can see you. All right, let's try this again. And then... There we go, we can see your screen now. All right, sweet. I knew something seemed just a little bit different. Okay, so we're good now. Okay. Um, so uh, now going back to it, um, so you can see neovascularization, you'll see it a little bit better in a second. Um, with these pinpoint vessels there, um, you lose that, uh, that ability with, with uh, conventional halogen light. But so I, I you know, in my, my opinion, um, the KTP laser is great to even manage these, these people with, with, um, with malignant disease if they do pretty well. Um, all right. Going on to the, um, the CO2 laser, you, you know, the obvious are it's, it's far infrared, which means it's not visible. Um, so when you use a free beam form, that little red dot is a helium neon laser. It's a, that's like 630 some odd nanometers. Um, the obvious are is you can, again, use a free beam or, or the waveguide handpiece. Um, I think the free beam um, in terms of uh, line of sight um, is, is really a great advantage, you know, in tight quarters, um, it, it bar none is, um, is, is the laser you want to use. You also, I put in question mark here is you can, you can technically um, have three instruments, so three hands, and I'll show an example of that. Um, it's a pretty safe laser. Um, it's highly efficient, has high absorption, um, so it only causes a superficial injury on, on traditional power settings. Uh, and that's because all, all tissue that we use lasers on um, is made of water. Um, some disadvantages, what I mentioned earlier, is um, access and degrees of freedom. With the, with, the, with the free beam laser, you have to be completely coaxial. Otherwise, you're going to bounce off the instrument and um, you, you lose some of some of the energy from time to time because the laser can be out of focus. And again, no laser is really great at um, sessile disease or bleeding, but um, certainly, uh, again, the advantage and the reason we use lasers is traditionally uh, cold steel. Uh, you don't coagulate even any of the tiniest blood vessels. Um, so um, this is a pre-op is I know Dr. Hatcher, I think she gave you guys a lecture on airway stenosis, but again, the, the free beam laser, um, when, when you're in tight quarters or you're using a small laryngoscope with, um, uh, with a small aperture and um, difficult visualization, by far um, the CO2 laser is gonna be um, the, the instrument of choice. Um, and then um, just skipping ahead, because I know you guys already got a lecture on this. Um, goodness. Um, this is an example um, of how you can use the laser in, with, with, as, a, as a third instrument, essentially. So um, this is a lady that had posterior glottic stenosis, and um, she was trach dependent when she came with me. Um, there's a great article by Ed Damrose that describes a posterior, like a post cricoid advancement flap. Um, and what you can't feasibly do this with a KTP laser or even a hand piece, you really need three hands. And essentially what the surgery is, is you raise a flap between the arytenoid cartilages, which I'm doing here. Um, and essentially what you're doing is you just set your laser in the middle of the, of the field and you move the larynx around. Um, to uh, put the tissue that you want to ablate under tension on both sides. Um, and in, in doing so, you can raise this posterior mucosal flat. Um, next, what you do, and this part's a pain in the butt, as you can see by slipping instruments, but you're, you divide the inner arytenoid scar band. Um, hers, she, you know, she looked like a, a grade one with them. Um, with, uh, with just a scar band between the vocal processes, but she didn't move afterwards. So um, you, you divide the inner arytenoid scar, which often is taking out the inner arytenoid musculature um, and then freeing up the arytenoid cartilages. 
Um, and again, this is the situation where it's tight quarters and you need to spread things apart and you still need a, uh, an instrument to cut things away. So that, that's spreading apart the inner retinoid region. You can already see your airway opened up a little bit. Um, and then you pull this flap in uh, and you suture in the, pa in the place and cuss a lot uh, during that portion of the procedure. But um, ultimately, you know, you, she was a lady that came in with very little mobility um, and you, you do have this kind of weird looking larynx afterwards, but um, she got decannulated without affecting voice quality or aspiration. So I, I think in, in that regards, the CO, there's no, no way you, you can do that with, without, um, without having three instruments, so that hands down, um, that's where the, the CO2 laser uh, can be really beneficial. Um, and then, you know, for, for chip shot, uh, TLM cases, um, so grade one disease, um, where, where you want to use something pulse that's highly accurate. Um, I'm glad my videos are working so great off ethernet, but, um, the CO2 laser is, um, is, is very, is very beneficial in my opinion, the, the best one to use. Um, there is a lot of, uh, of, of data and there are a lot of folks that like to use the KTP laser for the same reason as I mentioned before and that's um, one it's uh, with with the fiber it's um, it's very very um, very easy to get in difficult places which is which is this example um, this guy had a, a, a T1 lesion that was very anterior um, and um, Hopefully I don't get kicked out again. I will say I tried these yesterday and they worked with my wife. So I apologize that things are kind of choppy right now. I don't know why. But um, the, uh, when, when again, you have a difficult exposure and you can't get certain places, um, the ability to have the laser at the tip of your instrument so you can really manipulate your, your hand um, is, is, um, is paramount and, and in that regard um, for anterior disease I, I think that I, I personally use the KTP laser and again um, you can use the um, you can use the CO2 with the waveguide. Um, I can go more but I, I think we're getting close to the end I you know um, in terms of, of, of TLM uh, I'm happy to go through, but if, if people have particular questions, I, I, I'd open it up for questions at this point. Um, or if you guys want me to keep going, I can keep going. Any, any questions? You guys want me to keep going? This is probably gonna be another it's going to be over 10 minutes. So that's why I, I wanted to take a pause. So there's a question here. Do you have any particular resources to identify standard settings for various procedures? Um, that's a very, very good question. If you read a lot of the literature um, for, it's going to be kind of lesion specific and um, laser specific then um, you'll, you'll see what settings those providers use, which is a, entirely anecdotal and based on experience. Um, but, but no, a lot of it is, um, is, is based on, on preferences of the provider and use over time. Um, even if you kind of dig through Cummings, which you would think would be our Bible, um, they, um, they don't really make too much reference in terms of actual laser settings. Um, again, the, the tissue effect you tend to want is, is vaporization, um, without dramatic, um, thermal spread to, to other tissues. Um, the, the, the best resource I think for residents, um, I, I, and it's actually pretty eloquently written, granted the, you know, the devices they use are, aren't, they're not the same ones we use here, but. The principles are the same. Is the um, the the TLM uh, PDF from uh, the uh, South African 
uh, online atlas. I think, I think that's a, a great example. And again, it's, it's also um, written or edited by Wolfgang Steiner, who is a, um, he's, he's the man when it comes to TLM. And most of the proponents for, for TLM were initially European um, and, and based on, on a lot of his results. So, um, uh, you know, for, for all your, for all your cases, uh, with laryngology or head and neck that do this, I, you know, I would, I, it's a quick, easy read and it's very descriptive. Um, and again, it, it, it goes over the concepts of TLM, uh, uh, as well in terms of the nuances of some settings and stuff. So I, I would say that would be the best one in my opinion. Um, any other questions? I think I think that's the one I I I'll try to get these slides posted. I think that's the one that I put in at the beginning. I put the link up for it. Oh, these are these. Yep, it's this one. Um, So, got myself. So I should still be sharing, right? Um, so if you if you guys don't know this website, I mean it's it's made so many additions since I started residency, not even that that long ago. But this guy here um, is, uh, is frankly, they're all great. Um, but for for this particular um, this particular topic, I think it's 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 really really good. All right. Well, um, I will try to get these slides out to you, um, and uh, for for your reference, you know the references I put in the beginning are are great, and um, you know best of luck to everyone and. Um, uh, I, I think uh, I didn't put my email up. I, I can add that to the uh, to my uh, initial slide. So if anyone has questions, feel free to reach out to me. Alrighty. Well, stay healthy. Thank you very much. You got it. Bye-bye.